My name is Van. I am a tech marketing engineer here at Pierce. So you've heard Kunal go over the use cases, our vision, uh, and Naveen talk about the you know, architecture, the deep dive. So um, what I'm going to talk about is just the, you know, what the user sees when they want to procure Cloudbox Store and when they want to deploy Cloudbox Store. So what we'll start with first is the procurement options. So we have lots of customers out there who have you know, various uh, requirements. So we want to be flexible for our customer base, right? So we have two options, right? So the first option is pure as a service. This is what Kunal uh, alluded to earlier. Uh, and I'll go into the details of that next. Uh, but option B is the AWS marketplace where they can go directly to AWS and just subscribe to our service, right? So go back to option A. <clears throat> pure as a service. So for those of you guys who don't know what that is, uh, it's actually, you know, previous to the, the new branding, it's actually called uh, ES2, Evergreen Storage Service, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and that was actually something that came before even Cloud Block Store. That, what that essentially uh, gave our customers the ability to do is to consume flash rate storage or flash blade uh, as a, through a subscription rather than purchasing array, an array, right? So it gave that cloud-like experience in terms of consumption and, and purchasing it, right? Um, so they don't have to purchase uh, a flash array every three to five years, they just subscribe to the service. So for Cloud Block Store, we decided, okay, that actually fits perfectly to what our, cus our customers want in consuming services uh, through the cloud. So it fit perfectly for that unified experience for our customers who are using it already on-prem with Flash Array and they want to use Cloud Block Store. So on top of that, since it is the same subscription anyways, what we uh, can uh, allow customers to do is let's say they, uh, they work with our sales team uh, to get a contract and you know, the contract's one to three years and they have you know, say 100 terabytes that they want to consume in storage. They can now mix and match that from not just flash rate, but they can say, hey, I want now, you know, I start with the flash rate at 100 terabytes, but I want to move uh, you know, 80 terabytes towards the flash rate and maybe 20, 20 terabytes to Cloud Block Store. It's all within the same contract anyway, so it doesn't really matter to us. So they can have that ability to, to port that over, right? So that flexibility going back and forth uh, in this hybrid world. I two questions. Yes. So, and it comes to, as far as what we have on here is, today, technically, Pure is 100% partner delivered, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it says like, you've got AWS Marketplace direct to customer and the offered slide cled option like that. Does that change that model in some way? No, so when, when you go to the, when the customer goes to AWS, they, there's an, and they have partners that work with Pure, they can actually enter, there's a field where they can say, hey, yeah, my, you know. I'm You're saying they can, but normally for anything else, they would have to do that. Mm -hmm. Is that, or can they actually omit the partner in that case, and it actually is direct to customer at that point? Yeah, they can omit it. Uh, and, and, if, uh, and if they decide later that, you know, actually I forgot, that I do have a partner that led me to this, we can actually fill that in after the and fact. Right, well. right, yeah. that in? Yeah. And the other question is, why is everything in tibibytes as opposed to terabytes? <laughs> Uh, I just, I hate 1,000 versus 1024 math. It's like, why, you have to make me do the job now? Because I'm just curious, because it's on the slide. I think it's been historically uh, you know, an argument of back and forth, so I don't know if we want to get into here, but we don't it's something, need to. We've, had, we've, something okay. we've had for, even on-prem, um, so yeah. it just, for consistency sake in this is case. the best kind of correct. So, uh, when somebody uses the marketplace to purchase cloud block storage, let's say 10 terabytes, you deploy the two EC2 instances, seven virtual drives, S3, all that's done for that uh, transaction? Yeah, so I'll go into the deployment next. So the first part is just going to, you know, the first step is procuring it, getting the license for it, and then we'll talk about what it looks like to deploy on either method. It's the same process, actually. Um, so and, and go, and to go contract, so AC2 instances and stuff like that, you want to be able to fire them up, fire them down pretty much on a, on a you know, the whim of a developer kind of basis, right? But the month-to-month -month contract is for the, the CBS service? It's for our service, yes. And it's not really for all the AWS hardware yeah, that's on, a, beyond those that. Are, those are two separate things completely, right. Although you will deploy it, I get you. Right. Um, so to give, give a little bit more details on the AWS marketplace, so now, you know, again, we have two models for different customers' uh, needs and use cases, right? Uh, so now with AWS marketplace, it's more of a you know, short-term, month-to-month, so for customers who don't want to commit, right? They want to try it out first and then commit later. Uh, customers may have pre-commits with uh, AWS already, or, and, and they want to go through one single vendor, they can use the uh, AWS, AWS marketplace as well, right? Um, it is, uh, as you um, mentioned, a lower entry point, so 10 and, terabytes to start and with. And Cloud Snap 
it's got nothing to do with this. But nothing. To cloud, do. It's a yeah. separate cloud Snap is a completely different feature that can you know be uh, used with Cloud Block Store. Yeah. But this, yeah, that's. Yeah, think, Cloud Snap, there's like, you know, it's, it's included in the software. The only cost you pay there is the AWS S3 storage that we're using to offload. That's right. it. Um, so lower bar of entry to the AWS marketplace. Um, the only thing is that you can't now do the mix and match thing with Flash Array, right? So you'd be applying this subscription only to the Cloud Block Store. However, if you want to migrate down the road, you say, hey, you know, I want to commit to a long-term contract. It's better economics for me uh, with a long-term contract, and I like this, so we can actually convert you to a pure as a service contract after that. Right? So again, flexibility for our customers, right? Okay, so now to your question about deployment. So you see here, I'm, I'm just kind of t taking a step back. Uh, you see that there's the procurement <laughs> process and then there's the deployment. So after the procurement process, uh, you end up with a key. Either option, you end up with a license key to use as many cloud box or instances as you want, right? So you take that key, you go to the deployment process, which is the same no matter how you uh, procured it. It's basically the AWS uh, marketplace. So you go there, t search for Cloud Box Store, you'll see two listings, one for, for procurement, one for deployment. You click on the deployment one, and you go through the, you know, the, the next, next, next sub to subscribe to using it and deploying it. And what it'll do is take you into your AWS account and launch you into CloudFormation. So at this point, customers who are familiar with AWS, uh, they should be familiar with what CloudFormation is. Uh, and they would essentially um, click launch. We, we provide a YAML file for them to you know, deploy everything. Uh, and then they just select a few parameters, enter some customs that, customizations that they want, you know, their, the, the name of their instance, you know, this is where you enter your key, what uh, model you want to deploy, uh, the subnets that you want to deploy in, things like that. And then it takes about 10 minutes to deploy. All right, so the formation goes in, grabs all the resources it needs, configures it to the parameters that you want, uh, and then you're left with uh, this output page, and you have you know, all the things that you need to access Cloud Box, right? So you have the management IPs, you have the replication IPs, you have the um, iSCSI IPs. Just at this point, it's just like a flash array on-prem, right? So you manage it the same exact way. Um, so in terms of management, I'm just going to show you what it looks like. You're not really needing to managing, manage anything in the console. You just I've got yes. a question when I come back to deployment. Yes. So Pure and Pure One's been really good at keeping an eye, checking things, you know, letting customers know about things. Is there a component in that a lot of people public, you know, like we can put this into, you know, go back a couple slides. Yeah. We've got it where you're filling in information. Uh, one more slide, right there. So yeah. we're filling in all this information. We're saying, hey, it's in the subnet, you know, it's so and so forth. And uh, when it comes to storage and Amazon, people publish their keys a lot and put their very protected company information on the public accessible internet and on GitHub all the time. Do you have maybe some mechanism in Pure One to go and check their stuff to make sure like, hey, I know you entered this information and did you know you're exposed in this particular way? Some kind of retroactive way so that way they're not putting the keys to the kingdom literally out there on the public internet. So, just, just as I, I'm not, I imagine the answer is no, you absolutely don't have that today. I'm saying you might want to have that because yeah. that would suck because it sucks every time it yeah. happens. Half of the breaches are people who put their stuff just right there and it's like, yeah, yeah there you go. Feel free to go and access it. Yeah, so we, yeah, I mean, you answered it. We don't. We don't have it today, but no, that's a great idea, you know, for us to, uh, it's, it's a, le it's a, le it's a layer of protection. It's a asset of pure one at yeah. that point. Yeah. You, so, you, you were saying uh, that the cloud formation template does drift detection, does, does mm -hmm. detection of changes. So the yeah. most common thing is somebody setting the security permissions on the S3 bucket incorrectly. Presumably your drift yeah. detection would see that and, yeah. but and would flag. To alert and to alert and let them know that you know this is something like a vulnerability. Like may, they may need mm -hmm. to go address this to your point. Yeah. 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 Um, some and of we that. may be detecting it, but we right now yeah. don't so, have the ability or to just, communicate. I mean that. it's and it's not a misconfiguration. That's often a default configuration, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, By uh, people who go and yeah. like uh, all all, you know. So open everything up, it makes yeah. it easier. We'll fix it later. I do it. There is never a later. <laughs> so uh, a few years ago, the leader in virtualization had a, a hackathon in which they, inv they invited developers to come in and, and, and create applications on their platform. And, and it was a hackathon contest. 
And they gave what looked like very much this process to create the infrastructure to create their app. And anybody who was not an infrastructure person did not complete the hackathon. Who is this aimed towards? Like, who's the client for it? Because when I look at this, I understand it. I give this to my developer, cloud native, AWS newbie. Yeah. They're going to look at this and say, I scuzzy what? Like, who is the audience for this? Or, or well, to that point, you give it to your storage admin, and he's like, I don't know the answers to the other questions. He may know his array name, he may know his iSCSI subnet, but he may not necessarily know some of the other bits of the piece. Right. This is why you need to buy a DevOps. I do need a DevOps. <laughs> yeah. Can we get but, an oh. Agile with that? Do you sell a DevOps yeah. with this? But this is, why, this is why I asked the, yeah. the question about uh, the cloud volumes. I mean, mm -hmm. you need a simpler product for well, I guess developers. It, I, don't, yeah. I don't have a problem if it's... If this is infrastructure and you guys are walking my hand through some of the stuff that it, that's kind of AWS issues, that, that's fine. But if it's like, okay, I have a cloud platform team within my infrastructure team, they're going to look at this and they're just going to say, yeah, we'll just do something different than this. I, I would say that in the customers I talk to, it's the, the nature of the role is changing in the same way that when VMware happened, mm -hmm. storage people had to start learning how vSphere worked um, and vice versa. The vSphere people had to start learning stuff about how storage worked and network worked and, and so on. So sysadmins have been doing that since forever. So this just becomes one more thing that your sysadmin yeah. team works, which is one reason why the, the, the whole DevOps thing is a little bit of a misnomer because Operations management, like SRE exists for a reason. So this I'm fine if this SRE. is sysadmin, sys but the, 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 I think you're absolutely saying then it's not developer. If I'm, if I'm right. AWS no. native, I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'm, well, going to look, yeah. I'm going to download the appliance, look, start to walk through the setup process, and I'm like, yeah, this isn't for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even if you're cloud native, there is an SRE team when you get to a certain level of scale right. because yeah. your developers can't manage the infrastructure anymore in the same way that when we wrote code on pizza box some machines ages ago, you got to a certain scale where someone has to be doing yeah. the but and I think that, of the sorry, And I think that's kind of also the theme of what we were talking about before, which is when we were talking about Kubernetes, for example, the person who is responsible for providing the Kubernetes cluster to their developers is perhaps the person if we're going to go with the de developer-centric perspective, is the person I, would need to understand. I, I, I would, and one extra thing I'd say on this is, at the top it says, specify stack details. I'm, I'm expecting people to type things correctly or drop down versus if it was a you know, pure storage install wizard. And most of that's already filled in because I already have my credentials entered. So it gives me, uh, the, the hard part is I've got to enter the license key. And most of the other stuff is just selections. They, uh, they unless are, I'm doing right? multi-zones yeah. and stuff yeah, like that. Right. But to, if you remove the people from the equation, it minimizes the chances of them screwing up. Yeah. But the alternative of if they're generating YAML files, at which point, that's a whole separate conversation. Yeah, but I think you know, there are things we are looking at. I mean, again, not supported in version one, like you know, quick start. You know, that sure. may be another way to kind of simplify what you guys just talked about around deployment, where you can probably deploy the entire stack based mm -hmm. on like an application you're trying to deploy, the infrastructure that goes with it. So we absolutely want to try to enable those kind of deployment methods too. Um, just, yeah, remove the, remove the error. To, this is great for your AWS native people, your cloud yeah, native people yeah, today. Yeah. Yeah. But we're trying to drag a lot of legacy the, yeah. storage people and yeah. legacy infrastructure yeah. people. And you're going to, they're just going to be like, I'm just going to buy on-premises. It's going to be easy. I'm just, I'm not going to do this. This is just too much hard. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, yeah, I, I think that's the challenge of bridging these two worlds, right? And getting people to understand, you know, okay, I'm on-prem, but now I'm on cloud, and how, how do things work? How do they align? Yeah. Uh, and you, there is a bit of knowledge that you have to, you know, when you go to AWS, you have to learn a few things. Uh, you know, they, there are concepts that do, uh, are, do exist in the on-prem world, but you still have to know where to click on and what's a, what's a subnet, what's a VPC. And those, once you kind of get past that part, everything actually really lines up well, right? I mean, you're just selecting what network it's you're the getting past that yes. part. Right? Yeah. Yes, that yeah. Bridges I agree. that gap <laughs> a Agreed. bit. Yes. Yeah, so that's why, uh, you know, um, Kunal mentioned in terms of, you know, getting a brand new VPC up, get, you know, in a clean environment for those who don't even know what AWS is, Quick Start's an, an option for us to deploy that. For us, we want to deploy in customers existing, so they probably already have 
VPCs and subnets, so we want to address that part. Uh, or they can manually create a brand new VPC you know, in version one, but once we get the quick start part uh, up and running, um, deploy everything in one shot and well, everything's clean. The full circle of, or they can misconfigure a VPC and, and, and then... Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. It'll deploy. It'll create a whole VPC for them. Create mm -hmm. subnets for them. Create the routes or whatever it's needed, and then you just go off and mm -hmm. start. Right. What's the uh, model number there under item three? So there's two. There's a VA 10 R2, VA 20 R2. There's just two, uh, two uh, sizes essentially of cloud box. So one with more one's capacity. One's faster than the other, or one's more data than more, the other. More capacity. Um, you know, the the compute controller instances are uh, larger. Uh, so yeah. you're going with a C5. Uh, C5N uh, 9x large versus an 18x large between the two. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Good. Um, so at that point, again, we deploy. It takes about 10 minutes to deploy, and you're off and running. And so in terms of what it looks like when it deploys, again, you're not managing anything here. This is what you'll see when it's done. Uh, you'll see two controllers, uh, and they're all EC2, so they're all in the same console. And you see those virtual drives, which are, again, EC2 uh, computes. Um, when you go to, you know, again, if you forget where the IPs were, you go directly to those EC2 components, look at the Ethernet ports, and they'll describe which one's which. And for the management, it's just Ethernet interface. Phase three, and that's the IP address. And when you log in, at this point, if you're familiar with Flash Array, everything's very straightforward, right? You go in, you have a Flash Array, you create a volume, you don't choose RAID groups or anything, everything's just, you know, one simple uh, option, and you, you're off and running, right? Um, okay, so now I want to quickly just go over through a few demos. Uh, I have a video well, that we're going to quick, bring quick up. Question. Yes, yes. I'm curious, when you were showing the, the console, you know, you see all the EBS volumes, EC2 instances. Yeah. Who owns those, and what mechanisms are put into place to put the junior admin from deleting a, one of the things that he doesn't recognize and causing havoc? Yeah, so um, so th it is in a customer's VPC. So it is your account. You own it. Uh, as a best pra so as best practice, when you deploy the stack, the stack will have uh, you know uh, termination protection. So you have that turned on. Mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of the computes, I mean, there's. Um, in terms of uh, permissions to do things, uh, you know, if, hopefully your junior admin doesn't have all the permissions to go delete stuff. Hopefully. Well, yeah. Hopefully. So that's one, one that's way. personal account. So. What's that? It's on their personal account they're doing all this. Uh, you can segregate things from people from doing certain things in certain, you know, areas. Good role uh, But yeah, but again, you can also go in and, and set protection uh, against you know, individual this components to protect them from getting terminated as well, right? Is the CBS data deduped and encrypted? As it exists on the instance store, the data and S3. is absolutely identical. You, what you'll see in terms of the data reduction is going to be pretty much what you see in Cloud Block Store. And we use the always on encryption that we have on the purity software, same thing. Like every data, be it metadata or a data block, is encrypted. So I'll jump, I'll start up the demo, uh, Van. Okay, cool. good to go. That's yeah. Perfect. You guys see that? Okay, great. So uh, I talked about the, you know, showed the slide on deployment. This is kind of what the end end. Uh, will look like. So again, so the, the AWS Marketplace, we go into the deployment listing, right? Pretty much click to subscribe. This is the de deployment of it, by the way. So you say, okay, I want to, here are my terms and conditions, right? So I'll take a uh, look at that. Click next to continue. Yeah, and then I'll go and select the region, right? So which region do I want to deploy in, right? So I'll choose the region available. Click to launch. And at this point, this goes to launch into the CloudFormation uh, console. All right, so it takes you into your console. Here's the YAML file that's going to be pre-populated for you. So you click next, next, next. Here's that you know, parameters uh, page that I was mentioning earlier. So enter the name, your validation key, you know, again, the, uh, the security groups, the, you know, the subnets that you want to deploy in. Uh, and then, oh, yes? Question. We stopped doing click next, next, next because APIs. Can I call this with an API? Yeah, so the, the next, next, next part was just in the deployment. You don't, it's a starting point. Once you're in, you can just go straight to your CloudFormation and you have that YAML file. You can always go there. You don't have to go to the AWS Marketplace every time because yep. you know where to go already inside uh, CloudFormation. And just invoking a command line is, makes for a boring demo. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Once you can do this, go, you can do anything in the command line. These are just parameters. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so again, we're going to go through, just you know, select all the, uh, the drop-downs that are available and go to next. At this point, you can put tags on it to protect it from being deleted and, and you know, to organize things. You can put uh, user parameter, uh, per permissions so only certain users can deploy it. Uh, and then at this point, it deploys, right? So it's going to take 10 minutes here. I'm going to time-lapse it. 
and when it comes back, you'll see the whole stack has been deployed. So you can take a look at what's, uh, what actually happened under the covers. So you know, we're scrolling down, you're seeing that it takes, goes in and creates parameters that you've, or creates instances, uh, and takes in the parameters that you've, uh, you've, uh, you've entered and configs it. And when it comes up, you'll have a fully uh, available stack for Cloud Block Store. And that's the name of it. And if you go to the outputs, this is where you'll see your IPs that I mentioned earlier. So at this point, you can take that IP, this management IP. You can access it uh, by just jumping on through a web console or through CLI, even if you want to do everything through APIs. Um, at this point, what I'm going to do is log right into this brand new Cloud Block Store that I just deployed. Enter the IP, log in. And I mean, you would not be able to tell that it's a, a cloud block store instance except for the side of it, because it looks identical to a physical flash array. So customers who are used to that already know what, what, it, uh, what the look and feel is. But there's that dashboard. The next thing you do is create a volume. And you have a, you know, no RAID to choose from. It's just a simple volume. Choose the size, give it a name, and then you're done, right? So you have a volume. Um, so in my next demo, I'm going to show the whole cloud snap you know, life cycle that we talked about earlier. So what I'm gonna do is, you know, I have a on-prem flash array already, take a cloud snap of that, and then restore it into a, a cloud block store instance. So this is my on-prem flash array. I have a volume called my data, right? So we're gonna go in, take a look at that volume. Um, this volume is you know, connected on-prem as well to a, in this case, it's a physical host. Uh, I'm gonna go in and just write some data, right? Just to prove the, the whole thing out. I'm going to create a new file, and I'm going to put some data on it. All right, so let's go through that here. All right. And once it's saved, it's going to be on that my data volume. And what we, so in terms of the diagram, to kind of give you guys a visual, we're taking that, we're going to cloud snap it to uh, the S3. So, this is what we'll do. We'll go into the uh, protection group. So protection group, you know, if you guys don't know, it's just like a consistency group for replication, right? So we're going to put our volume, that my data volume I created earlier, put it into this protection group. And that protection group is already connected to my S3 bucket, right? So it will periodically snap and send it. But I'll do a manual one right here just to kind of show that we can do it manual as well. I'll give it a name uh, with a, you know, a demo suffix. And I'm going to cloud snap it to S3. All right, so there's that snapshot that is going to S3. So what I'm going to do next is go and restore it from the S3 bucket onto my Cloud Block Store instance. So now I'm on Cloud Block Store. You can kind of see on the right-hand side there. It's a little different. Uh, but basically, what we're going to do first is connect it to my bucket. It's a brand new instance, so it doesn't know anything about the bucket yet, right? So we go in, connect it to my S3 bucket. I'm going to enter some of the parameters of that bucket, you know, things like the name of it, the um, the access key, the secret key, uh, and once it connects, then we can then restore it back onto the Cloud Block Store instance, right? Okay, so you can see it's connected. So that bucket is down below. That's my bucket that I'm connected to, and we'll go into that bucket. We'll look for that snapshot that I created earlier called demo. All right, right there. And now we're just going to go ahead and download it. And within that protection group, I can, down, I can restore granularly on a per volume basis. Right? So I had another volume in there already. So I can choose just this one volume. So I can do that. I'll say OK. And then it'll exist as if it's you know, on my uh, my instance locally is showing up. It's showing up as a snapshot. It's just like any other snapshot. You want to restore it now. You take it. You uh, you know copy it to a a normal volume and connect it up to your EC2. So that's exa exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to give it a name. So it's just my data, but I'm going to call it clone. And I'm going to do the copy of it now, and it will show up on my list of volumes. And I just at that point, once it's a actual volume, I would just connect it to my EC2 host, and I have a Windows host already. So I'll say connect. 
and I'm going into that EC2 host, going into the disk management, and there it is. Restored a volume from Cloud Snap. Open it up, and you see the same file system, same file, same data. Does so have you any questions? You could effectively do a Cloud Snap to an Azure blob and reconstitute uh, it to a Cloud Block storage on AWS if you wanted to. Yes, I mean, it's just a connection yeah. between the two. So yeah, we actually support uh, taking a Cloud Snap to S3 uh, to a bucket or to Azure Blob. Uh, in the last release, we supported the Azure Blob. And it's any S3 compatible storage, or is it just AWS, or? Uh, say it one more time. Any S3? Like, for instance, FlashBlade? <clears throat> For CloudSnap, we support, well, on the FlashBlade, we support NF, uh, so we can support so an NF, NFS mount, an S3, but on the FlashBlade, we'll do just the NFS for NFS now, NFS right? now, but we can, yeah, we can, we, had, we can support S3 too. Bobby? Well, it's, you know, there are and even a dozen I wanted, S3 vendors out there, compatible vendors out there, of which AWS is one. Of course. Yeah, yeah, no, so we absolutely, like, supporting FlashBlade is... But you're not def supporting FlashBlade S3. No, so uh, it's it's work in progress for us. We will support AWS. The other thing I wanted to point out for S3 is we support S3 standard and S3 infrequent access. So actually, we just added support for infrequent access where we basically, based on your policy, we'll tear those snapshots to IA because they obviously, you know, you get better cost economics with that too. So. Okay. So the next demo I'm going to show is replicating a VVOL from a flash rate to the cloud blocks. A very similar process, right? And this is actually a video that Cody here made. So I just shortened it a little bit. Uh, Cody is our, our in-house celebrity. Um, and uh, so he created this video. Uh, I'm going to do you know, my best to you know, do what the great job that he did. But basically, we're, he's going to use a VRA. So talk about the whole orchestration of replicating things. Uh, you do it manually, but we decided in this case, let's just show an, an addition to the solution to the stack is using VRA uh, to do the workflow. So in this case, again, I'm starting, my on starting with on-prem, going to the guest OS. Uh, and there he has uh, two database files already, right? So he's going to go, and what we're going to do is put these, uh, this VVOL that we're going to replicate in a storage policy. So we talked about storage policies earlier, but it's part of VMware where you can select policies for it to automatically do things, right? Uh, so in this case, we're going to put it into a storage policy that will replicate from a flash array to a cloud block store. So he's just choosing those parameters for that um, storage policy. And it's going to go ahead and replicate. And while it's doing that, what we're doing is uh, just showing the whole end-to-end -end process, right? So we're just going to spin up a brand new EC2, in this case, to uh, in, a in AWS. So you could have created it in the uh, AWS console, but we're, again, using VRA to orchestrate all this. So what Cody's doing is creating this EC2, this Windows EC2. Uh, he's also going to go in and configure it, right? Uh, and once he configures it, uh, we'll just take that volume that's been replicated onto the other side and connect that volume over there, right? So. We're going to let it uh, play out here. All right, so now it's configured. You see that you know, it's, it has the iSCSI IQNs already for this uh, brand new EC2 that we're deploying. And the next step uh, is pretty much to, you know, hey, let's take the, the volume, the VVOL volume that we replicated and connect it into this EC2. And he has a workflow for that as well. So we're going to give this uh, volume a name, just like I did earlier with that uh, uh, the Cloud Snap volume. We're going to go in and find that protection group that we had replicated on the Cloud Block Store. Right? So there's that protection group. And within that protection group, he's going to look for that volume. Again, there may be multiple volumes, but you just want to restore one. So he finds that VVOL volume and runs it. And now he we're going to log into the actual EC2 itself. Uh, and just like before, we'll open up disk management, open up the file system, and see that our database files are there. And at that point, you're restored. All right, so you open up the file, open up the volume, and you'll see those files. 